Book Two of the Shadow and Bone Trilogy by Lee Bardugo, Siege and Storm. Chapter 18 The Gritsky Mansion was in the Canal District, considered the least fashionable part of the upper town because of its proximity to the bridge and the rabble across it. It was a lavish little building bordered by a war memorial on one side and the gardens of the convent of the Sancta Elisabetta on the other. Mao had managed to secure a borrowed coach for the evening, and we were tucked inside its narrow confines with a very cranky Tamar. She and Toya had grumbled long and loudly about the party, but I'd made it clear that I wasn't going to budge. I also swore them to secrecy. I didn't want word of my little excursion beyond the palace gates to reach Nikolai. We were all dressed in the style of Suli fortune tellers, in vibrant orange silk cloaks and red lacquered masks carved to resemble jackals. Toya had remained behind. Even covered head to toe, his size would draw too much attention. Mal squeezed my hand and I felt a surge of giddy excitement. My cloak was uncomfortably warm and my face was already starting to itch beneath the mask, but I didn't care. I felt like we were back at Kirim's Inn, casting off our chores and braving the threat of the switch just to sneak away to our meadow. We would lie in the cool grass and listen to the hum of the insects, watch the clouds break apart overhead. That kind of peace seemed so far away now. The street leading to the Pickle King's mansion was clogged with carriages. We turned onto an alley near the convent so that we'd better be able to mix in with the performers at the servants' entrance. Tamar carefully shifted in her cloak as we descended from the coach. She and Mal were both carrying hidden pistols, and I knew that beneath all the orange silk she had her twin axes strapped to each thigh. What if someone actually wants his fortune told, I asked, tightening the laces of my mask and pulling my hood up. Just feed him the usual drivel, said Mal. Beautiful women, unexpected wealth, beware of the number eight. The servant's entrance led past a steam-filled kitchen and ran into the house's back rooms. But as soon as we stepped inside, a man dressed in what must have been the Gritsky library seized my arm. Just what do you think you're doing, he said, giving me a shake. I saw Tamar's hand go to her hip. I, you three should already be circulating. He shoved us toward the main rooms of the house. Don't spend too long with any single guest, and don't let me catch you drinking. I nodded, trying to get my heart to stop hammering, and we hurried into the ballroom. The Pickle King had spared no expense. The mansion had been decorated to look like the most decadent Sully camp imaginable. The ceiling was hung with a thousand star-shaped lanterns. Silk-covered wagons were parked around the edges of the room in a glittering caravan, and fake bonfires glowed with dancing colored light. The terrace doors had been thrown open, and the night air hummed with the rhythmic clang of finger cymbals and the wail of violins. I saw the real Sully fortune tellers scattered throughout the crowd and realized what an eerie sight we must make in our jackal masks, but the guests didn't seem to mind. Most of them were already well in their cups, laughing and shouting to one another in boisterous groups, gawking at the acrobats twirling from silk swings overhead. Some sat swaying in their chairs, having their fortunes told over golden urns of coffee. Others ate at the long table that had been set up on the terrace, gorging on stuffed figs and bowls of pomegranate seeds, clapping along with the music. Mal snuck me a little glass of kvass, and we found a bench in a shadowy corner of the terrace while Tamar took up her post a discreet distance away. I rested my head against Mal's shoulder, happy just to be sitting beside him, listening to the thump and jangle of the music. The air was heavy with the scent of some night-blooming flower and, beneath that, the tang of lemons. I breathed deeply, feeling some of the exhaustion and fear of the last few weeks ease away. I wriggled my foot from my slipper and let my toes dig into the cool gravel. Mal adjusted his hood to better hide his face and tipped up his mask, then reached forward and did the same with mine. He leaned in. Our jackal mask bumped snouts. I started to laugh. Next time, different costumes, he grumbled. Bigger hats? Maybe we could just wear baskets over our heads. Two girls came swaying up to us. Tamar was by my side in an instant. We pushed our masks back into place. Tell her fortunes, the taller girl demanded, practically toppling over her friend. Tamar shook her head, but Mal gestured to one of the little tables laid out with blue enamel cups and a golden urn. The girl squealed and poured out a tiny amount of sludge-like coffee. Vasuli told fortunes by reading the dregs at the bottom of the cup. She downed the coffee and grimaced. I elbowed Mal in the side. Now what? He rose and walked to the table. Hmm, he said, peering into the cup. Hmm. The girl seized his arm. What is it? He waved me over. I gritted my teeth and bent over the cup. Is it bad? The girl moaned. It is good, said Mal in the most outrageous silly accent I'd ever heard. The girl sighed in relief. You will meet a handsome stranger. The girls giggled and clapped their hands. I couldn't resist. He will be a very wicked man, I interjected. My accent was even worse than Mal's. If any real Suli overheard me, I'd probably end up with a black eye. You must run from these men. Oh, the girl sighed in disappointment. 
You must marry ugly man, I said, very fit. I held my arms out in front of me, indicating a giant belly. He will make you hippie. I heard Mel snort beneath his mask. The girl sniffed. I don't like this fortune, she said. Let's go try another one. As they flounced away, two rather tipsy noblemen took their place. One had a beaky nose and wobbly jowls. The other threw back his coffee like he was gulping kvass and slammed the cup down on the table. Now, he slurred, twitching his bristly red mustache. What have I got in store? And make it good. Mal pretended to study the cup. You will come into a great fortune. Already have a great fortune. What else? Uh, Mal hedged. Your wife will bury you three handsome sons. His beak-nosed companion burst out laughing. Then you'll know they aren't yours, he bellowed. I thought the other nobleman would take offense, but instead he just guffawed, his red face turning even redder. Have to congratulate the footman, he roared. I hear all the best families have bastards, chortled his friend. We all have dogs, too, but we don't let them sit at the table. I grimaced beneath my mask. I had a sneaking suspicion they were talking about Nikolai. Oh, dear, I said, yanking the cup from Mal's hand. Oh, dear, so sad. What's that, said the nobleman, still laughing. You will go bald, I said very bald. He stopped laughing and his meaty hand strayed to his already thinning red hair. And you, I said, pointing at his friend. Mal gave my foot a warning nudge, but I ignored him. You will catch the corpa. The what? The corpa, I declared in dire tones. Your private parts would shrink to nothing. He paled. His throat worked. But at that moment, there was shouting from inside the ballroom and a loud crash as someone upended a table. I saw two men shoving each other. I think it's time to leave, said Tamar, edging us away from the commotion. I was about to protest when the fight broke out in earnest. People started pushing and shoving, crowding the doors to the terrace. The music had stopped, and it looked like some of the fortune tellers had gotten into the scramble, too. Over the crowd, I saw one of the silken wagons collapse. Someone came hurtling toward us and crashed into the nobleman. The coffee urn toppled off the table, and the little blue cups followed. Let's go, said Mal, reaching for his pistol. Out the back. Tamar led the way, axes already in hand. I followed her down the stairs, but as we stepped off the terrace, I heard another horrible crash and a woman screaming. She was pinned beneath the banquet table. Mal holstered his pistol. Get her to the carriage, he shouted to Tamar. I'll catch up. Mal, go. I'll be right behind you. He pushed into the crowd toward the trapped woman. Tamar tugged me down the garden stairs and up a path that led back along the side of the mansion to the street. It was dark away from the glowing lanterns of the party. I let a soft light blossom to guide our steps. Don't, said Tamar. This could be a distraction. You'll give away our location. I let the light fade, and a second later, I heard a scuffle, a loud oof, and then silence. Tamar? I looked back toward the party, hoping I would hear Mal's approach. My heart started to pound. I raised my hands. Forget giving away our location. I wasn't going to just stand around in the dark. Then I heard a gate creak, and strong hands took hold of me. I was yanked through the hedge. I sent light searing out in a hot flare. I was in a stone courtyard off the main garden, bordered on all sides by yew hedges, and I was not alone. I smelled him before I saw him. Turned earth, incense, mildew, the smell of a grave. I raised my hands as the apparat stepped out of the shadows. The priest was just as I remembered him, the same wiry black beard and relentless gaze. He still wore the brown robes of his station, but the king's double eagle was gone from his chest, replaced by a sunburst wrought in gold thread. Stay where you are, I warned. He bowed low. Alina Starkov, Sol Koroliva, I mean you no harm. Where's Tamar? If she's been hurt, your guards will not be harmed, but I beg you to listen. What do you want? How did you know I would be here? The faithful are everywhere, Sol Koroliva. Don't call me that. Every day your holy army grows, drawn by the promise of your light. They wait only for you to lead them. My army? I've seen the pilgrims camped outside the city walls, poor, weak, hungry, all desperate for the scraps of hope you feed them. There are others, soldiers, more people who think I'm a saint because you've sold them a lie. It is no lie, Alina Starkov. You are the daughter of Kiramzin, reborn of the fold. I didn't die, I said furiously. I survived because I escaped the Darkling, and I murdered an entire skiff of soldiers in Grisha to do it. Do you tell your followers that? Your people are suffering. Only you can bring about the dawn of a new age an age consecrated in holy fire. His eyes were wild, the black so deep I couldn't see his pupils. But was his madness real or part of some elaborate act? Just who will rule this new age? 
You, of course, Sol Coraliva, Sancta Alina, with you at my right hand, I read the book you gave me, Saints Don't Live Long Lives. Come with me, Alina Starkov. I'm not going anywhere with you. You are not yet strong enough to face the Darkling. I can change that. I stilled. Tell me what you know. Join me and all will be revealed. I advanced on him, surprised by the throb of hunger and rage that shot through me. Where is the firebird? I thought he might respond with confusion, that he might pretend ignorance. Instead, he smiled, his gums black, his teeth a crooked jumble. Tell me, priest, I ordered, or I'll cut you open right here and your followers can try to pray you back together. With a start, I realized that I meant it. For the first time, he looked nervous. Good. Had he expected a tame saint? He held up his hands placatingly. I do not know, he said, I swear it. But when the Darkling left the little palace, he did not realize it would be for the last time. He left many precious things behind, things others believed long since destroyed. Another surge of hunger cackled through me. Morozova's journals? You have them? Come with me, Alina Starkov. There are secrets buried deep. Could he possibly be telling me the truth? Or would he just hand me over to the Darkling? Alina, Mal's voice sounded from somewhere on the other side of the hedge. I'm here, I called. Mal burst into the courtyard, pistol drawn. Tamar was right behind him. She'd lost one of her axes, and there was blood smeared over the front of her cloak. The apparat turned in a musty whirl of cloth and slipped between the bushes. Wait, I cried, already moving to follow. Tamar bolted past me with a furious roar, diving into the hedges to give chase. I need him alive, I shouted at her disappearing back. Are you all right? Mal panted as he came level with me. I took hold of his sleeve. Mal, I think he has morose of his journals. Did he hurt you? I can handle an old priest, I said impatiently. Did you hear what I said? He drew back. Yes, I heard you. I thought you were in danger. I wasn't, I... But Tamar was already striding back to us, her face a mask of frustration. I don't understand it, she said, shaking her head. He was there, and then he was just gone. Saints, I swore. She hung her head. Forgive me. I'd never seen her look so downcast. It's all right, I said, my mind still churning. Part of me wanted to go back down that alley and shot for the operat, demand that he show himself, hunt him through the city streets until I found him and pry the truth from his lying mouth. I peered down the row of hedges. I could still hear shouting from the party far behind me, and somewhere in the dark, the bells of the convent began to ring. I sighed. Let's get out of here. We found our driver waiting on the narrow side street where we'd left him. The ride back to the palace was tense. That brawl was no coincidence, said Mal. No, agreed Tamar, dabbing at the ugly cut on her chin. He knew he would be there. How? Mal demanded. No one else knew we were going. Did you tell Nikolai? Nikolai had nothing to do with this, I said. How can you be so sure? Because he has nothing to gain. I pressed my fingers to my temples. Maybe someone saw us leaving the palace. How did the opera get into Azalta without being seen? How did he even know he would be at that party? I don't know, I replied wearily. He said the faithful are everywhere. Maybe one of the servants overheard. We got lucky tonight, said Tamar. This could have been much worse. I was never in any real danger, I insisted. He just wanted to talk. What did he say? I gave her the barest description, but I didn't mention Morozova's journals. I hadn't talked to anyone except Mal about them, and Tamar knew too much about the amplifiers already. He's raising some kind of army, I finished. People who believe that I've risen from the dead, who think I have some kind of holy power. How many, Mal asked. I don't know. And I don't know what he intends to do with them. March them against the king? Send them to fight the Darkling's horde? I'm already responsible for the Grisha. I don't want the burden of an army of helpless Akazatsia. We're not all quite so feeble, said Mal, an edge to his voice. I didn't... I just mean he's using these people. He's exploiting their hope. Is it any different than Nikolai parading you from village to village? Nikolai isn't telling people that I'm immortal or can perform miracles. No, Mal said. He's just letting them believe it. Why are you so ready to attack him? Why are you so quick to defend him? I turned away, tired, exasperated, unable to think past the whir of thoughts in my head. The lamplit streets of the upper town slid by the coach's window. We passed the rest of the ride in silence. Back at the little palace, I changed clothes while Mal and Tamara filled Toya in on what had happened. I was sitting on the bed when Mal knocked. He shut the door behind him and leaned against it, looking around. This room is so depressing. I thought you were going to redecorate. I shrugged. I had too many other things to worry about, and I'd almost gotten used to the room's quiet gloom. Do you believe he has the journals? Mal asked. I was surprised he even knew they existed. He crossed to the bed, and I bent my knees to make room for him. Tamar's right, he said, settling by my feet. That could have been much worse. I sighed. So much for seeing the sights. I shouldn't have suggested it. I shouldn't have gone along with it. He nodded, scuffed the toe of his boot along the floor. 
I miss you, he said quietly. Soft words, but they sent a painful welcome tremor through me. Had a part of me doubted it? He'd been gone so often. I touched his hand. I miss you too. Come to target practice with me tomorrow, he said, down by the lake. I can't. Nikolai and I are meeting with a delegation of Kirch bankers. They want to see the Sun Summoner before they guarantee a loan to the Crown. Tell him you're sick. Grisha don't get sick. Well, tell him you're busy, he said. I can't. Other Grisha take time to... I'm not other Grisha, I said, more harshly than I intended. I know that, he said wearily. He let out a long breath. Saints, I hate this place. I blinked, startled by the vehemence in his voice. You do? I hate the parties. I hate the people. I hate everything about it. I thought you seemed not happy exactly, but I don't belong here, Alina. Don't tell me you haven't noticed. That I didn't believe. Mal fit in everywhere. Nikolai says everyone adores you. They're amused by me, Mal said. That's not the same thing. He turned my hand over, tracing the scar that ran the length of my palm. Do you know I actually miss being on the run? Even that filthy little boarding house in Cofton and working in the warehouse. At least then I felt like I was doing something, not just wasting time and gathering gossip. I shifted uncomfortably, feeling suddenly defensive. You take every chance you get to be away. You don't have to accept every invitation. He stared at me. I stay away to protect you, Alina. From what? I asked incredulously. He stood up, pacing restlessly across the room. What do you think people asked me on the royal hunt? The first thing. They wanted to know about me and you. He turned on me, and when he spoke his voice was cruel, mocking. Is it true that you're tumbling the sun summoner? What's it like with a saint? Does she have a taste for trackers, or does she take all of her servants to her bed? He crossed his arms. I stay away to put distance between us, to stop the rumors. I probably shouldn't even be in here now. I circled my knees with my arms, drawing them more tightly to my chest. My cheeks were burning. Why didn't you say something? What could I say? And when? I barely see you anymore. I thought you wanted to go. I wanted you to ask me to stay. My throat felt tight. I opened my mouth, ready to tell him he wasn't being fair, that I couldn't have known. But was that the truth? Maybe I had really believed Mal was happier away from the little palace. Or maybe I just told myself that because it was easier with him gone. Because it meant one less person watching and wanting something from me. I'm sorry, I rasped. He raised his hands as if to plead his case, then dropped them helplessly. I feel you slipping away from me, and I don't know how to stop it. Tears pricked my eyes. We'll find a way, I said. We'll make more time. It's not just that. Ever since you put on that second amplifier, you've been different. My hand strayed to the fetter. When you split the dome, the way you talk about the firebird. I heard you speaking to Zoya the other day. She was scared, Alina, and you liked it. Maybe I did, I said, my anger rising. It felt so much better than guilt or shame. So what? You have no idea what she's like, what this place has been like for me. The fear, the responsibility. I know that, I know, and I can see the toll it's taking. But you chose this. You have a purpose. I don't even know what I'm doing here anymore. Don't say that. I swung my legs off the bed and stood. We do have a purpose. We came here for Ravka. We... No, Alina. You came here for Ravka. For the Firebird. To lead the Second Army. He tapped the sun over his heart. I came here for you. You're my flag. You're my nation. But that doesn't seem to matter anymore. Do you realize this is the first time we've really been alone in weeks? The knowledge of that settled over us. The room seemed unnaturally quiet. Mal took a single tentative step toward me. Then he closed the space between us in two long strides. One hand slid around my waist, the other cupped my face. Gently, he tilted my mouth up to his. Come back to me, he said softly. He drew me to him, but as his lips met mine, something flickered in the corner of my eye. The darkling was standing behind Mal. I stiffened. Mal pulled back. What, he said. Nothing. I just... I trailed off. I didn't know what to say. The darkling was still there. Tell him you see me when he takes you in his arms, he said. I squeezed my eyes shut. Mal dropped his hands and stepped away from me, his fingers curling into fists. I guess that's all I needed to know. Mal! You should have stopped me. All the time I was standing there, going on like a fool. If you didn't want me, you should have just said so. Don't feel too bad, Tracker, said the Darkling. All men can be made fools. That's not it, I protested. Is it Nikolai? What? No. Another Akazatsia, Alina? The Darkling mocked. Mal shook his head in disgust. I let him push me away. The meetings, the council sessions, the dinners. I let him edge me out. 
just waiting, hoping that you'd miss me enough to tell them all to go to hell. I swallowed, trying to block out the vision of the Darkling's cold smile. Mal, the Darkling. I don't want to hear about the Darkling anymore. Or Ravka or the amplifiers or any of it. He slashed his hand through the air. I'm done. He turned on his heel and strode toward the door. Wait. I rushed after him and reached for his arm. He turned around so fast I almost careened into him. Don't, Alina. You don't understand, I said. You flinched. Tell me you didn't. It wasn't because of you. Mal laughed harshly. I know you haven't had much experience, but I've kissed enough girls to know what that means. Don't worry, it won't happen again. The words hit me like a slap. He slammed the door behind him. I stood there, staring at the closed doors. I reached out and touched the bone handle. You can fix this, I told myself. You can make this right. But I just stood there, frozen, Mal's words ringing in my ears. I bit down hard on my lip to silence the sob that shook my chest. That's good, I thought as the tears spilled over. That way the servants won't hear. An ache had started between my ribs, a hard, bright shard of pain that lodged beneath my sternum, pressing tight against my heart. I didn't hear the darkling move. I only knew when he was beside me. His long fingers brushed the hair back from my neck and rested on the collar. When he kissed my cheek, his lips were cold.